I think to a great extent, someone who has not played the game, but who understands the game, will be able to teach someone to play the game. I don't think you can teach someone to win. I don't think you can teach someone to be great. All of those comes from within to a great extent. But when you need to get from a particular level to a higher level, I think you need someone who's actually played the game. And then when you get to the very top of it, you need someone to be able to help you at those moments who you respect and admire because he or she has actually done that. Mm. I, I find it very hard to believe that if you're ranked in the top 200 in the world today, that you can actually have someone who has not played the game teach you how to win a quarterfinal match at the Grand Slam. I, I, I don't think so. And I could be wrong. There is, there is one outstanding example of where I'm wrong, which I will tell you in a minute. But I do believe that you do need someone. In my case, for example, when I was growing up and I was playing in the early stages between the ages of winning the Indian Championships and becoming in the top 10 in the world 18 months later, I was coached by Pancho Gonzalez, mm -hmm. who for me was as, as high as you can get in the tennis world. And the way he also taught me was because, also because I, I molded my game on his, or he saw me and said, oh, well, you know, this guy I can help. Because whether consciously or unconsciously, my game was similar to his. And then at the tail end of my career, I went back to someone to be able to keep me on the tour long enough because I felt he was the perfect person who I thought I played like. And so he helped me for a few years, helping me stay on the tour perhaps longer than I should have. And he kept me playing at the highest level. So those things are important when you're talking about coaching. I don't think you can just jump in there and, sure. and coach a person to a great championship. The example that I bring up, which kind of beats all the norms, is uh, Richard Williams mm -hmm. and the two girls. Now, he learned tennis from a book, textbook, and then took them out on a public court in Compton in one of the worst sections of Los Angeles and taught these children how to play. Both of them we know are moderately successful. And the rest is history. <laughs> so I think that's, that's not a good example to use, but that's an exception to the rule. And what in that case worked? If you, if you had to reflect on that, uh, what about that uh, made it work for them to be so extraordinarily successful? I think in Richard Williams' case, so I, Richard, who I know fairly well, and Orosin also, by the fact that they had a single-minded devotion to those two children who were meant to be tennis players, which is the way they were literally born to be, number one. Number two is he was almost fighting an uphill battle in the fact that he wanted these two young African-Americans to play a white sport and uh, literally show the world that we can do it. And the fact that these girls and boys were making so much money and he thought that this is a way to come out of an economic sure. uh, difficulty, which they were in. And the biggest risk for them, as you always said, oh, was there a big risk at 30, 40, 4, 5? If you ask him that question, he would always tell you that, uh, oh, there's no pressure on that at all because the biggest pressure for us was to be able to walk out of your home to the tennis court, make sure you don't get shot on the way. That was the high risk venture for us. So I think you're coming from two different perspectives of the way people thought. And Richard was uh, very clear in the way he was able to actually have that belief and work ethic to get these girls to be able to become what they are. 